we're going to talk now about federalism uh, in the 20th and 21st centuries. Uh, we, uh, in an earlier lecture, uh, explored the federalist uh, problem uh, or the issues of federalism under the Constitution through the uh, ratification of the 17th Amendment in 1913. That's where we're going to begin today. So to set the stage, uh, we're just on the eve of the First World War. Uh, we've seen the growth uh, in the closing decades of the late uh, closing decades of the 19th century of uh, some fairly sizable uh, tax-free fortunes, uh, the captains of industry, the robber barons. Uh, taking uh, what had been local economies and turning them into a national economy. We've seen the creation then of national economic problems that the federal government uh, considers itself uh, to be the, the, certainly the most efficient and maybe the only power uh, uh, that might effectively uh, regulate them. The uh, Sherman Antitrust Act is passed in 1890 to stop some of these abusive practices. It meets with some trouble in the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, and, but we're slowly moving, uh, it seems, as a practical matter, away from a world in which the, the states direct uh, the affairs of life uh, primarily uh, into one in which the federal government does, at least in areas perceived as being uh, national problems. And that family of areas only increases over time. The First World War begins 19. 14, the U.S. enters 1917. There's an, a new national effort uh, that's necessarily uh, primarily uh, national. Uh, the war ends. Uh, the 20s roar uh, until 1929 when the stock market crashes. And then we've got a real national emergency, the Great Depression, which persists for years uh, and is the real trigger in the 20th century for the expansion of federal power uh, at the expense of state power. The federal government uh, exercising, when once Franklin Roosevelt's elected president, exercising uh, its powers uh, under the uh, Commerce Clause of the Constitution, uh, denied uh, by the Supreme Court through the 1937 term, and then in 1937, uh, in the Jones and Laughlin Steel case, the Supreme Court decides, well, uh, it's, it's okay uh, for the Congress to exercise uh, its Commerce Clause power over these national problems. Jones and Laughlin Steele had to do with uh, rights of strikers. Uh, so that opened the door uh, to federal regulation, Commerce Clause regulation. Uh, the areas of national interest uh, to which uh, co Congressional Commerce Clause uh, read federal power was applied in the following years, uh, started expanding greatly uh, from uh, strict, fairly strict economic regulation. We move to regulation of uh, the environment, of race relations, uh, uh, regulation of, of, uh, of uh, criminal activity, uh, all of these uh, primarily on the authority of the Commerce Clause, which authorizes Congress to regulate commerce among the states. It's through the expansive interpretation of what constitutes commerce and how much interstate connection there has to be. Now, Commerce Clause, we're not going to talk about. That would be the subject of a, of a complete lecture or, or two. Um, what I want to uh, uh, focus on is that this, this period of, of expansive federal legislation was made possible by a uh, fairly generous interpretation of the scope of Congress's Commerce Clause power. Uh, which, which sort of came to uh, an end uh, in 1995 in uh, the Lopez decision, about which some of you may know something. Lopez uh, was a uh, kid in public schools in San Antonio, uh, decided one day to carry a gun to school. This was a violation of Texas law, but it was also a violation of a fairly new federal statute called the Gun-Free School Zones Act. And the federal prosecutor said, let me take this one. So Texas said, you got him. Uh, and that turned into a major Supreme Court uh, constitutional law decision. The court asked the U.S., under what authority did you pass a statute saying that, uh, that Lopez can't carry a gun to school? Uh, the federal response was the Commerce Clause, to which the Supreme Court said, well, how is telling Lopez he can't bring a gun to school a regulation of commerce among the states? And the government 
tried to come up with an answer, but by that time, they hadn't spent much time thinking about it at the time that they were drafting the legislation. Because for a long time, all the government really needed to do was say Commerce Clause, and that was enough. Uh, and the court invalidated the statute. It's the first time it had happened since, since the 1937 term that Congress had been told, no, that isn't valid Commerce Clause legislation. What that resulted in was sort of a federal rethink. Congress continued to regulate and continues to regulate under the Commerce Clause, but the court in, in Lopez and a series of other decisions, including the Morrison decision, have said, well, that regulation really needs to be regulation of commercial activity. Um, guns to school, we're not seeing the commercial uh, connection. Morrison, um, uh, acts of violence against women, we're not seeing the commercial connection. So that's, that's invalid Commerce Clause legislation. And so Congress has, has, sort of, has, has started moving in, in a slightly different direction uh, and using a different power under Article I, Section 8, which is the tax and spend power, which is in the first, section of, uh, first part of Article I, uh, Section 8, that Congress is empowered to, to tax, to raise money, to spend for the general welfare. Um, this isn't brand new. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, a number of years ago, Congress decided uh, that it would be better if we had a, a uniform drinking age of 21. And it, it didn't have the power, it didn't believe it had the power under the Commerce Clause to, to order the states to raise their drinking age to 21. So instead it passed a statute saying, you guys in the states are receiving a lot of money uh, for highway uh, maintenance a lot of federal highway funds. Um, we think that th there's a connection between young people buying alcohol, driving drunk, and highway accidents and increased cost of maintenance for federal roads. So the deal is if, if you can do what you're doing, but if you don't raise your drinking age to 21, we're going to reduce the amount of federal highway funds you get. And South Dakota said, no, <laughs> and, and went to court, and, and the this, this spending uh, uh, withdrawal threat was upheld as constitutional. There, there were our limitations on the exercise of power this way. Um, there has to be some sort of co connection between the, the purpose of the spending, the withholding of the spending, uh, and the policy objective that Congress is trying to achieve. Uh, for instance, and this was, this was mentioned in the, the case that I'm talking about, uh, if Congress were to say, raise, uh, you have to um, move the state capital or we're going to cut off your federal highway funds, that would probably not fly. Uh, but, as, but, as, but as long as there's a connection uh, between um, uh, some persuasive connection between the, the spending and the withholding and the policy objective, uh, the court's likely to uphold it. Uh, other illustrations uh, include the No Child Left Behind Act. Uh, you know, there was a time when Congress might have thought, well, we'll just pass a statute saying that uh, all school districts have to have their kids achieve a certain score on some federally uh, prepared standardized test. Um, that would have in intruded uh, uh, tremendously into education, which is an area of, of longstanding historical state and local uh, concern, um, but you know, Congress might have come up with an argument that educated kids are, you know, spend more money in interstate commerce by buying things from other states and you know this sort of thing. Um, but but they didn't. Uh, when No Child Left Behind was passed because of the Lopez decision and said it's got to be commercial, so instead they said, well, don't we give a lot of money to the states for education? Answer: Yeah. So um, so let's just say if you don't do this no child left behind stuff, we'll withhold your state funds. And so this has become common. This is how the Affordable Care Act works. And the parts that were declared unconstitutional, it's because they didn't satisfy that test of providing a part one of the other requirements is there has to be a meaningful alternative. Can't be coercive, you have to do this. There has to be, a, you have a choice to do this state, uh, we'll withhold, and then you can meet and decide whether you really want the money uh, or whether you're, um, whether you're okay with foregoing the money in order to avoid fulfilling the, um, the federal policy objective. Uh, all of this to say uh, that, that, ev that the, the notion of federalism has evolved dramatically since, since the founding. Um, we've, uh, and it's, and it's, it's, it's revived as something that people are talking about a lot now. Power to the states and this sort of thing. 
Um, we've seen some uh, textual infrastructure changes. Uh, the, um, the 14th and 15th Amendments were new. The ones that say no state shall, so they're, they're additional new post-Civil War impositions of responsibility under the federal constitution on the state governments, equal, can't deny equal protection, can't deny due process. Um, the 17th Amendment, uh, the other big textual change, direct election of senators. No longer does the state legislature, the state government, control who will represent the state in Congress. Now the people get to decide directly. So a populist initiative, but it had an impact on federalism and the power of states as state, state governments as states to control what was happening, uh, what was happening in Washington by shifting the constituency. Uh, of the group. We've also had uh, the Supreme Court play a role in uh, affecting the federal state uh, power balance through the incorporation line of cases. Um, remember Barron versus Baltimore, 1833 said that the Bill of Rights doesn't apply to the states. The states are only limited by their own bills of rights. Um, that changed when the Supreme Court uh, developed the, in the uh, incorporation uh, line of cases. So now, after the 14th Amendment, the Due Process Clause includes the free speech from the First Amendment, so you got to do that, and uh, the uh, right to petition, and free exercise, and, and the Second Amendment, that's among our most recent incorporations, that applies to the states too. All of the incorporation cases have federalism consequences because they're imposing new federal constitutional limitations on the, the, the range of action uh, of, of uh, the states. Uh, and then the expansion of, of federal legislative power, uh, first the Commerce Clause, uh, and then uh, more recently the Tax uh, and Spend Clause, have made it easier for the federal government to fill holes left by the, the, the retreat of state uh, legislation. Now this isn't to say that states don't do anything, it's just that relative to the federal government, they do a whole lot less today than they did in 1790. Um, we've had dramatic textual changes, judicial uh, interpretation uh, gen engendered changes uh, as well. And, and, and it's also not to say that these changes have been entirely unwelcome by the states. Um, you know, uh, there's, there are a lot of states out there that are happy to receive federal funds. Uh, you know, there's a certain, we call it it's a cooperative federalism. Uh, and the, the more federal monies the states are dependent on, the more willing they're going to be, presumably, to participate in a reduced state power regime. The alternative, of course, would be raising taxes domestically so that we, or getting rid of programs. But if we're going to start paying for our roads, then, and we don't want the federal government to impose federal policy by attaching conditions to receipt of federal highway funds, well, then we've got to come up with the money somewhere to, to pay for those roads ourselves. Uh, and so when you have uh, sort of, when you're, when you're trapped as a lot of, of pro-states rights people are with also a lower state taxes pledge, you're sort of caught. It's sort of how do you have both? And it's not entirely clear to me that you can have both. It's sort of maybe, maybe one or the other given our, given our, present, um, our present dynamic, um, maybe. Um, what's accounted for this? Uh, and this is what I'll, I'll close with. Uh, I think they're, they're, it's fairly easy to see um, um, what, to me anyway, it seems uh, uh, what the major causes are. Uh, one is, it, it, this may be inevitable. Um, you know, it, it may be uh, that uh, when, the, when the founders put together the, the government, it was designed to be inefficient on multiple levels. It's hard to pass legislation within the federal government, and then you got the state governments too. So this is gonna, this is sort of that government which governs, least governs best approach to governance. But over time, we have two pressures. One is towards greater efficiency. Uh, we, you know, we're, the world is much more integrated. The country needs to be able to act, uh, federal and state components. Uh, and then within that federal structure, it's a whole lot more efficient for the federal government to take charge and to have one decision maker, right, rather than 51 decision makers. Um, this, there, but there's a price for that, of course. It, it, it makes government more remote, et cetera. 
Um, but, it, but it may be uh, an inevitable historical trend. The other thing I think that's happened is, is sort of what we might call the, the Civil War problem, that the issue of the rights of states, and states initially were conceived by Madison to be the, the protectors of liberty from the federal government. But very quickly, because of the association of states' rights with the preservation of slavery, states became seen as oppressors and retrograde. Um, that, that vision uh, didn't change in the 1950s and 60s when states led the fight against desegregation. Uh, and so there's sort of a bad, it's hard, it was hard for a long time to say states' rights without being, um, without being perceived as being racist and all of those issues sort of came together. Now, I don't know whether that's changed, um, but it's an issue that I think has to be um, resolved. Um, and, and the last thing I guess I'd say uh, is, uh, you know, if this may be inevitable trajectory of history, maybe it's a, um, um, uh, a consequence of, of association of the states' rights movement with racism, um, but maybe it's also a good thing. You, you know, and this is, this is an open question. Um, uh, you can make, and people have made arguments in favor of states' rights. It's laboratories of democracy and local government stuff. But people also make arguments in the other direction. Uh, and it's, I think it's important, uh, as I've said before, to, to respect the arguments of the people on the other side. Th these, these aren't easy um, questions to resolve. Uh, and, and maybe the, the person who expressed the ambiguity best um, uh, over this issue of states' rights was, was Hank Williams, Jr. Uh, who said uh, in a song that some of you may know, uh, and with this I'll close, uh, if the South would have won, we'd have had it made, might even be better off. Thank you. Freedom 101 is made possible by generous support from Woody Young and the University of Oklahoma Alumni Association. Freedom 101 is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu.